So this is us today. There's seven of us, which is ambitious. And we just want to go by alphabetical order and do a quick intro, what we do, how we ended up here. And go for it. Amar, not to put you on the spot. <laughs> hey guys, my name is uh, Amar Bushadu. Um, you can also call me Omar, because um, uh, I think that's easier. Um, I, I've been with Blue Cat for seven years now, um, and I have I've done various different roles within Blue Cat. Um, while most of my time was spent with uh, supporting our enterprise customers, large customers, um, I've also managed to lead a team of our talented individuals, uh, support engineers today. Thank you. Oh, that's me. Okay, fine. Um, my name is Dana. I think I've met, yeah, we've all met. And I run corporate communications here at Blue Cat. So I'm looking at this conversation from the perspective of what knowledge right now is hidden in everybody's heads that would be better shared. And I'm also looking at it from the perspective of the IT community is a really special thing. And the more that we can share, I think, knowledge and information and also, um, be known as the people who are leading conversations like this. Like I, I think that there's a reason that all of you are part of the Tech Field Day family, for example, is because we go out of our ways and do this kind of stuff. So that's what I'm looking at this conversation at, or the lens I'm looking at it through today. All right, my, uh, my name is Joopie Skaag. Um, I no longer have a daytime job. I, uh, I work for uh, for my own company as a doer of many things. So I organize conferences, both uh, independent community events, as well as commercial events, as well as help out vendors in this space, organize their events. I blog, I write, I create content together with uh, some other industry friends. Um, and so basically I am you know, in the marketing space of, of IT, uh, but I have a technical background, which uh, you know, makes me look at the IT industry and especially the DevOps movements that are happening with, uh, you know, with fresh eyes, with a, a pair of different eyes, instead of looking at the technical part of DevOps. I tend to look at the more cultural and, and organizational aspects of, of DevOps and try to bring value to, uh, to the community that way. Okay, and you, uh, in terms of background, so you said you no longer have a day job. What's, what's like the experience been in? So I, uh, I kind of did it, did it all, uh, but, but the last, I don't know, last 10 years, I've done my VMware VCDX. So I've, uh, uh, I've done a lot of VMware implementation and design. I've been a CTO for about five years for a big service provider uh, back here in the Netherlands. So um, I'm thinking about, you know, technology, technology decisions and how they impact the company I work for, uh, training people, mentoring people. Um, uh, creating IaaS platforms, um, and uh, most recently working for a supermarket where I helped start them on their transition into the DevOps world. Awesome. How am I going to compete, compete with that? <laughs> so I do have a daytime job uh, as a senior consultant at OpenLine. Um, I focus mostly at storage, uh, hypervisors, backup, um, so OpenLine is a cloud provider uh, all the way in the south of the Netherlands um, and we do a lot of projects at the customer site uh, or we provide cloud uh, platforms for them. Um, so then I'll manage the, uh, the insourcing or the migration projects. Um, yeah, that's it. Can I interject and just ask the context of these migrations and cloud projects? Like how big uh, are they? Yeah, they, how big are they or what? Ugh. Um, so it's a, it ranges. So we, we serve as smaller providers, uh, smaller customers, uh, all the way up till uh, the, well, the, the bigger ones uh, in the Netherlands, at least, um, uh, ranging to a couple of thousand of VMs. Um, so it's mostly lift and shift, um, where we provide the platform. Uh, and we basically pick up the, uh, the customer environment and host it uh, for them. And we'll do anything uh, all the way up till the technical domain. Uh, so we'll do ev everything from data center up till networking, um, uh, virtual machines. We'll, we'll hand it off when it gets to the application uh, side. Yeah. Okay, good to know. 
Hi everyone, my name is Kevin Wilson. I currently am the manager of Solution Architects for Blue Cat Networks, uh, reporting to Noel Reynolds, who you'll meet here shortly. Um, my background, I've, I've been in the, the IT realm, we'll say for a good 25 years now, now starting off in the, in the military in the US Navy right out of high school, um, doing your basic, you know, uh, land WAN management, desktop support type stuff. I'm um, stuck around in the in the networking world, so to speak, uh, for the, for the first five or ten years, and then moved over into into service management, and service delivery, and getting into more of operations, and then uh, got into the infosec and info protection world. Uh, did a stint at Symantec for for several years before joining uh, Blue Cat and and kind of moving back into into the networking world with a bit of a uh, of a play on security still. You're on mute, Ned. Okay. So I'm Ned Belovance. I uh, like, yo, I don't have a technical day job. I work for myself. <laughs> I'm founder of Ned in the Cloud LLC and apparently also a cartoon character, uh, which is fine by me. Um, <laughs> rather look at that than anything else. Uh, I've been in the industry for, I don't know, uh, almost 20 years now, uh, doing all sorts of roles from help desk all the way up to sysadmin and then consultant on cloud and DevOps projects. Uh, these days, I write for my blog. I create courses for Pluralsight. I do fun stuff like this when I'm invited, and uh, I host a podcast called Day 2 Cloud. Which rocks. Thank you. Thank you. We, we do our best. <laughs> So uh, I'm Noel Reynolds. I'm the director of solution architects for Blue Cat uh, today. Uh, but uh, to kind of like all of you guys, I've been in IT for about 25 years. Uh, I started really uh, doing uh, consulting, uh, and then I moved into a role where I was a support engineer for a, a large uh, data networking company. Uh, and I did that. I was at that company where I kind of evolved from like um, solution, uh, sorry, uh, enterprise support to more of a professional services role. Uh, I was a resident engineer on site at one of the biggest universities in the state of California. Uh, and then I became what we call a sales engineer at the time uh, for where I supported Navy Marine Corps for a number of years and then switched into the commercial space. Uh, I also, I, I joke, I did a two and a half year sabbatical at Symantec where I learned security. Uh, and uh, then I went back into uh, telecommunications and, and then uh, shortly after that I came over to uh, Blue Cat where I've been for about four and a half years now. Uh, and uh, I fill my spare time with listening to Ned's podcast and being jealous now <laughs> of his uh, cartoon avatar. So it's, uh, yeah, it's good times. So for context, I love that they come on the little cards and they're like playing cards and you collect them at the, the trade shows, I think. Was it Kofi City that does those? Or who is it? Uh, it was, I thought it was Rubric, but oh, uh, you know what it is. You're right. I, they'll I get think very angry if you mix them up, you know. <laughs> they didn't so true. a lot of time into making them, so I got it. Yes. Right yeah. Okay, awesome. So from here, I think that it's probably just easiest to go into the context of how um, some of us know networking, and I think probably the easiest way is to start with the people who, whose job or whose day job it is not, um, just to see what kind of interaction you guys have had mm. with the network team uh i can volunteer <laughs> so <laughs> uh for a long time i was the network team because uh, there was a, three of us <laughs> at the company i worked for and so uh by virtue of the last in they were like you do the networking now um so that was my interaction for the first six years of networking and then i went to a bigger organization that actually had a network team uh, and it was a, an interesting process because I had to sort of show my credentials to them before they let me make any suggestions about the network. They, they, were, they didn't necessarily trust me <laughs> to, uh, to have good ideas and suggest different things. Uh, and one of the very early things, I needed them to add some VLANs. And uh, I was using Cisco terminology, and they were using all uh, extreme switches. So they were like, you don't know what you're talking about. And I was like, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, so yeah, a little, little fun friction there, but we, we all worked it out. We made friends, we brewed beer together and, and life was good. It's funny, Ned, that you mentioned that. I, I can remember, you know, as a, as a, you know, as a, as a end user supporting, you know, our customers when I you know, had a desk job with an organization, they seemed like they would never trust you. You were never the expert, even though you knew the environment inside and out. 
they'd bring in a consultant, right? Or, or you know, they, they'd hire a team to come in and all of a sudden anything they wanted to do, they would trust explicitly, right? So <laughs> yeah. it kind of made me laugh that, you know, I could never get anything done, but I bring in a contractor, quick and easy. Yeah, yeah I, I, th that resonates to me. So uh, about 10 years ago, I started this whole journey of creating an IS platform for my then employer. Um, and that was based on totally new technology. So one of the things we implemented was um, and I see that, so back before it even was NSX by VMware. And we just had discussions all day long for weeks, for months about the, the networking stack because that had to change significantly, right? The design of a, you know, an underlay overlay type network is just completely different than what they were used to back then. And so I remember the discussions. Um, and at some point I was so done with it that I did in fact hire a contractor who did not know anything about NSX at all. And I just whispered to him, say this. And then he <laughs> said that, and that worked. So uh, in the end we did have a you know, pretty awesome network created for a multi-site IaaS platform, which was, you know, which was for that time uh, a significant effort. What's the reason for that? Like coming from a very non-technical background, what is the reason for this defensiveness? I think it's blast radius, right? If you break a server, you just broke the server, like whatever, you can fix that. If you screw up a storage array, you know, maybe you take down someone's LUN, but you know, not too bad. If you screw up the network, nobody can do anything. So I, I think that has made network administrators and I know me personally when I was a network admin I was very protective of changes and I was very cautious about making those changes it had to happen during a maintenance window because I knew that if something was screwed up then boom <laughs> you know nobody can get anything done and then I've got you know all these high level execs breathing down my neck asking me why they can't get on the internet so uh, I think that's that's definitely one source of the defensiveness yeah, the, I think the other thing too, and, and, and I would see this, uh, you know, when I used to support or when I was on site, at, you know, at, at a customer environment, but there's, you know, the concept of mean time to innocence, which is a joke, but it's, it's true, <laughs> it is, is a real thing because it's always the network until you prove that it's not. I mean, if, if a server is running slow uh, or, it, you know, is, is not provisioned correctly or what have you, it doesn't matter. You have to, you have to prove that all of the traffic is being delivered and it's being delivered in a timely manner before you can say no server team, go look at the way you have your application scaled on this box because um, again, it's always the network uh, at, at first. So I can definitely concur to that too, that most of our time um, that our team spends solving customer issues, it's five or 10 times. So every one out of two, um, it's usually something on a network that causes some weirdness somewhere that, you know, we have to start pressing down. And then sometimes you have to go down to the basics. Like you start from the client, you go hop by hop, you trace packet by packet, and that's how you prove. And that is a, a mountainous task to prove. Um, and until you prove it, you're always at fault. <laughs> yeah, I, so I had a very similar sort of situation. I was doing consulting for an Active Directory uh, forced trust that wasn't working properly. And uh, if anybody's worked with Active Directory, they know DNS is the backbone of Active Directory. And if anything is wrong with DNS, anything at all, AD does some funky stuff. <laughs> well, we couldn't get this trust to, to authenticate properly going one of the ways. And we ended up having to do, you know, Wireshark packet capture across multiple nodes. And then we finally figured out that somehow all the authentication was getting sent down to a particular domain controller in a child's domain that had been turned off. <laughs> and I don't know, like we don't know why the traffic was going there, but it was something in DNS and we eventually like honed it down to that and removed it. But in that case, the network actually was the problem, but the real problem was just misconfiguration of DNS and Active Directory, but you had to prove it, right? Yeah, and the, the funny thing is it's not easy to say it's DNS because, you know, it's generally the last thing that comes to anybody's mind. Wait, how about DNS? Like, what is that pointing to you? you know, it's always everything else that you check first and DNS is generally the last thing. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, it turns out to be more uh, uh, expensive, um, especially when you're working with large trading companies that have, you know, billions of dollars on the line by the minute or hours. Um, DNS is generally people look at last and, you know, uh, just working with uh, 
many of our uh, companies that I've with that have been one thing I tell them every time is that if you're the manager or managing team of this infrastructure, no matter if it's a DNS fault or DHP fault, just call us, just get us on the phone because it may not be us at the end of the day, but we want to be there as you troubleshoot this because it will save us time. It will save you time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I always check your host files too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, everyone, everyone is slightly experienced in, in infrastructure and especially in the VMware world will check DNS <clears throat> as one of the main culprits first. I mean, it's yeah. got to be DNS yeah. or NTP, right? Yeah. I, <laughs> I still see a lot of installs that actually don't configure DNS properly as well. They just install some equipment or install some virtual machines and they'll have some IP addresses. But if you resolve them, they still don't have any DNS records. It's, it's often forgotten in change processes as well, I think. Yeah, and especially in infrastructure, people just mm -hmm. don't care about DNS. Yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, is still the founding, you know, it's the lower level of your infrastructure. Yeah, it needs to be in there. Yeah. It makes your life easier. It's, it's really taken for granted. And, and the, you know, the, anal the best analogy that I've come up with, and, and I, when I'm interviewing, you know, for, for solution architects for my team or whatever, is to talk about it in the context of the oxygen in the rooms that we're all in. If the oxygen in the rooms that we're all in is just there and we're breathing and whatever, it's fine. If it's not there or if there's a problem with it, we're in real serious trouble. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but but no one is going to talk about it or notice it unless someone brings it up. And that's kind of how DNS is. And that, that's one of the challenges. My question is, okay, I mean, first of all, this conversation came right to DNS and I get it. Like, <laughs> Random. <laughs> Why do some teams not care? Like certain infrastructure teams or whatever it is, they don't set it up, right? Like, Why? Why are they able to, how are they able to do that in the first place? How does it not impact them or how do they, how are they able to think that it doesn't impact them? Well, I guess some people just use IP addresses and they yep. just rely on memorizing the IP address of, you know, I, I still remember the IP address of the two domain controllers in the first like network that I ever worked in. And there's no good reason for me to remember <laughs> that than I do, right? Uh, so I think part of it's like IP addressing. The other thing, and this is kind of like going back a while, is uh, WINS actually does work sometimes. So they may have been getting by by using WINS and not even knowing it, which that was the Windows uh, version of DNS that never worked that well. And please don't use that, but it still turned gonna, by default. <laughs> you know? I, I was going to joke that I was too young to know what that is, but, but anyone who knows me would know that's not true. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we could all pretend though. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Exactly. Sorry, what is, Windows, what is Windows again? I almost forgot about it, Ned. And then the you Windows don't bring it up. Right. <laughs> I, I think it was the Windows Internet Name System. Or, it was. Yeah. It resolved, it resolved NetBIOS names to IP addresses. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, yes. and it used to be one of the, the three things that you had to configure on a Windows host when you were standing it up. You had to provision, you know, you had to actually define the Win server, uh, just like you do a DNS server, just like you do, and, and DNS came later. But, you know, around the time that, uh, Windows was competing with uh, uh, what the hell is it called? Uh, IPX. Novell. Uh, IPX. Novell. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. About about that time where it was making that transition, you saw it kind of uh, fade away in favor of IP, and and you know we're all better off for it. <laughs> <'Cause>... <laughs> yeah. uh, but if you've ever worked on an older yeah. network, you might come across it sometimes, and. Uh, setting up proper replication, they had like pull and push servers, and there was ways to clear out and rebuild the the Wins database, and it was uh, what a mess. <laughs> um, so I'm so glad that DNS came in and sort of saved the day. But uh, I, I think for some older, curmudgeonly Windows admins, they they just want to use their IP addresses and not have to worry about this crazy DNS thing. Yeah. Yeah, I thought you, you, you was kind of onto something earlier too, though. Uh, he was talking about, um, you know, proving that the network uh, wasn't, wasn't at fault uh, and, and sort of the complexity. You know, it's kind of funny because the, in my career, uh, I started off the networking company I was working at uh, had, we supported every physical topology. So token ring, ethernet, you know, FIDI, uh, ATM, et cetera. And the thing that was interesting was there was a there was a period of time where everything was Ethernet and IP, and it was relatively simple compared to today, right? Um, when you get into your deploying an overlay, you know, multiple overlays on your underlay, and you have to have the knowledge of all of those things, right? And then also you're going to connect it to the cloud. You know, if you're you're if you're kind of coming up today in networking, you're not really able to 
grow with it from that simplistic way where it was just IP and just Ethernet on-prem. You, you have to really be knowledgeable on a variety of things. And that adds to the complexity, adds to the difficulty of deploying it. Um, there's a lot to learn. I mean, it's sort of balanced by the fact that now we can go to YouTube and, or, or go to a podcast and, and, and learn for a period of time. But, but it really, there is a high level of complexity and, and detail and, and, and multiple environments that we have to be knowledgeable about and we have to support. Uh, and that can be a real challenge for someone who's kind of coming up and learning. And, and it makes, it puts a lot of pressure on the networking team to stay, stay the pace with all the things that are changing. And that's just from the networking end, right? Like there's all these other teams that see this from a different lens, I'm assuming. Exactly. Yeah. I'm wondering what that perspective is. One of the things that made me really have to learn and adapt to DNS was the adoption of cloud and well before that VMware, but then also the adoption of cloud where I no longer could rely on a particular IP address being assigned to my system. And I was tearing down environments and building them pretty dynamically. So everything had to be C names. Um, I had to rely on the DNS resolution that was provided by whatever cloud provider I was consuming. Um, and so that made me have to go back and be like, okay, what, what was the C name? What's the difference between that and an A record? And what, what are all these TXT records I suddenly have to add every time I have to verify a new domain? Like I had to gain a new appreciation for DNS, uh, which the only time I knew it any better was when I was studying for MCSE and you had to know what a stub zone was. <laughs> Does anybody want to explain a stub zone? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be that kind of call, huh? <laughs> Good thing. So it's kind of it's kind of funny though that um, you know back back in the in the old VMware data center days you know stuff was pretty static. Um, there was an IP scheme; everyone knew that IP scheme. So there wasn't you know maybe there wasn't enough of a reason to to properly do DNS. And now with you know with cloud, with Kubernetes, with dynamic services, uh, you know ephemeral containers, there is no other way than to rely on a naming scheme. There is no way, you know, IP addresses are, are gonna work out. Um, and I have never, you know, I have never used IP addresses, you know, back uh, uh, since I stopped doing VMware installs. And there's no other way, I think, that in the cloud and with Kubernetes and with containers, there is just no other way than to rely on something as dynamic as DNS to, to kind of save you from that complexity, just as, Noel was uh, was talking about. It's just too complex to to do by heart. Yeah. Yeah, and and, and if IPv6 ever actually takes off, I mean, I I always joke with people that I, I think I've learned IPv6 like four times. I remember the DoD issued a, a DoD is a U U.S. Department of Defense, but they issued a mandate that said that by 2008, everything in the DoD will be single stack IPv6. This was 2001, so I had plenty of time to start studying, and you know, I, I swear I've learned it three or four times, but. You know, it's, it's not, um, in, in my view, it's really not that complicated. Um, once the hardware and software has kind of caught up with, the, you know, the ability to deploy IPv6. But to your point, you know, you're, no one's going to memorize IPv6 addresses. Uh, you, you, it's going to have to be DNS. Uh, and, and so that's also where we see it is really critical. Yeah, I mean, it, especially if you go large scale or, or you go something that, you know, is really dynamic, scales up and down. You know, you have to have something more reliable than, than you know, dynamic IP addresses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You guys are agreeing way too much. It's a very <laughs> friendly conversation. Okay, give, give us a difficult topic. Okay. Yeah. Go. <laughs> the, uh, the programming language? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I would definitely learn something in that case. I'm more just curious if you guys want because it sounds like you're pretty much on the same page though about networking in general. Is there any sort of like, are you just very educated people who happen to come from like different teams or is this the general consensus among the people I, that you work with? on? I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll say something controversial. I mean, I think, um, and, and I, I say this not to, you know, pick on anyone or whatever, but I mean, I think one of the biggest I think a CCNA course should be required training for everyone who works in IT, period. Um, you know, networking is the foundation of absolutely everything that we're doing from an IT perspective. It will help you in cloud. It will help you in, uh, if you're a storage guy, it will help you. And, and far too often when I'm interviewing people who have come from a, um, a company where they're supporting some kind of a security point solution, a SIM or, uh, you know, pick a, pick a product, right? 
networking to them is they get the IP address of their endpoint, they get the IP address of the gateway, and they're done. And that's not enough. And um, you know, it's the other thing I would say is is you know people need to know how to open up Wireshark and and you know and, and under you know and you should do that just for fun. Um, because you'll learn so much about what kind of traffic you're putting on the wire, what kind of traffic is coming to you, um, you know, what protocols exist on your network. Uh, and, you know, it's, I, I think that, I think I don't want to hire people who don't have at least a little bit of a networking background, who don't understand that these, all these devices have to communicate and how they communicate in different ways. Because you, like I said, you learn so much just from having that lens or that view. Uh, and if you don't have that, it's, it's, you're, you're probably, you're probably not in the right field to be totally honest with you. That's I, I'll take issue with that a little bit because I think it okay. really depends on what you do at, for work. So does it make sense for a, a software developer who's working on like serverless to understand how to take a Wireshark capture? Um, I, I don't think it necessarily does, but I'm, I'm curious if you want to make the case that that developer should also be able to pop open Wireshark and watch the, watch the line. I think at some point in time, that serverless container device uh, connects to a network. And when you're troubleshooting the bigger issue down the road, right, which you're going to have at some point, you're, you, you want to have an understanding, at least an understanding, right? Because you're going to have to, I mean, this goes to the whole... Uh, challenge of all the different groups that work within the company and what their knowledge is and how can they talk and communicate with each other. I, I think networking is sort of the glue that holds everything else together and having that, uh, again, it doesn't have to be super complicated. And, and you know, when I said CCNA, I, I competed against Cisco forever. Cisco's not, uh, you know, at that time, <laughs> like it would have been blasphemy to say that. And, and I, I certainly, I, I don't have a CCNA. I didn't, I, that's not the route that I took but I think it's a really good basic certification to kind of get people to think about how devices communicate with each other. And like I said, at some point in time, you know, if you are that server guy and you're server, you know, and, and you're having slow performance and you say, Hey, I think it's the network, you know, it gives you the ability to, to talk to the networking team in a way where you've done a little bit of troubleshooting and maybe not the server less guy, but the server guy. Um, but but it, you've, done a, you've done a little bit of troubleshooting to kind of get yourself to a point where, you can talk intelligently, you can give them useful information and your mean time to innocence or your mean time to resolution is going to be a lot, a lot faster uh, than it would have been otherwise. So I, I think you can take issue with it. I'm fine with that. But I, I think it's, <laughs> I think, it, I think networking is the glue that holds all this stuff together. Well, I, I like the, the, the concept that you share. There's, there's like a common language in IT and that networking has to do with that common language. So, you know, you have to, as the serverless guy, uh, serverless developer versus the networking admin, you have to have some kind of common understanding to be able to communicate. Mm -hmm. And yeah. there, I think there's merit to the concept of, of the, the network being that shared language. I do see that changing. I do see that instead of the, the layer two, layer three um, actual networking concepts, it is becoming much more on a layer seven uh, plane where yep. APIs are the thing that glues us together. So we should be able to talk APIs. How does this API communicate to that endpoint, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I do see that changing. I do see those conversations kind of moving up in the stack a little bit, but still I do agree that having some kind of, of understanding of networking um, will help your discussions, definitely. The thing I've, I've sort of been wondering about, and I, I think this is the first time where I've ever said it out loud. So, and by the way, I just on the prior point, Dana did ask me to say something controversial. So, you know, I was, I was trying to come up with something, but, but the thing <laughs> I've, I've, I've sort of been wondering for a while is, um, you know, you, you, when we, when we do talk about DNS, you know, a lot of times the DNS guy at a company is this gray beard who, you know, has been doing it for 25 years or, or, or longer. Right. And, and he's really kind of grown up on the technology. And I agree with you. I think everything now is going to kind of an API centric model. Uh, you know, everything's going to be automated. Everything's going to be orchestrated or what, or what have you. I, I wonder if we're going to lose though, some of the networking graybeards, if you will, who have that knowledge of how to provision redundant services. And, and, and you know, like the, there's this idea that we won't have to think about that anymore. Or we don't have to be concerned about it. This is all just going to work. Mm -hmm. And, and my, my question is, you know, are we going to lose something as those guys who feel like they're being kind of pushed out, they know the CLI really well, they know networking really well, but they haven't gotten into the API mode. 
is there still a place for them today because of their knowledge of how these systems interconnect and how you do things redundantly and, and, and what have you? And again, I'm just kind of, I've been thinking this out loud or, you know, out loud for the first time, but, but what do you guys think about that in terms of just the way things are changing? Well, I'd, I'd like to compare that to, to kind of the, the uh, physical server admin or the virtualization admin from just a couple of years ago. There's been this debate within those groups as well. You know, is our role still, still going to be there in a couple of years? Do we still add value to the company? And, and I dare argue that in a lo lot of cases, no, you don't actually add any value anymore but you still need to be there, right? So the, the cloud service provider still needs remote hands to fix, you know, re replace a drive, fix a server, um, you know, replace cooling components, whatever. Um, mm. And in within, you know, within certain companies, the VM admin still has a place, but is it novel? Is it innovative? Does it actually solve business problems? No, right? So it's become so much of a commodity that at some point you can argue, is it better to just, um, consume this as a service from a third-party service provider instead of doing it ourselves and having that knowledge in-house. Um, and, you know, for a lot of networking components, I'd argue, just get it as a service. Make sure that you have a reputable partner that does it for you. And they might employ the people. They definitely need the knowledge. Uh, it's a matter of, you know, is this relevant for us to build that capability in-house or not? Yeah, I, I've been hearing similar debates from the networking field on, you know, you have the traditional CLI, I like to copy things out of Notepad and drop it in the config. Um, and then the newer or, or the people who have updated their skills a little bit who are leaning more on that API declarative model of configuration. Mm -hmm. And the, the push from them is, if you're not learning these APIs, if you're not at least learning a little bit of programming, then you're not keeping your skills up to date. And if you wanted to get into an industry that didn't require you to keep your skills up to date, this is probably not the industry for you. <laughs> you know, 100%. I think that, that that's been fairly obvious uh, from the get go. It's not like technology didn't move quickly 20 years ago. It may have moved slightly less quickly, but it's not like it wasn't constantly changing and evolving. So uh, I think if you are that gray beard and you just want to rest on your laurels, you're like, I did my time. I went through the learning process you know, I'm now a master DNS person. It, that's not going to work out for you. It's not like becoming a blacksmith, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and to be totally clear, like I, I wasn't challenging that guys need to learn APIs today. I was just wondering, what about the other knowledge that they have? How things are connected? How you want to connect disparate systems? You know, mm -hmm. how do you mesh a network properly? Things like that. I agree. If, every, if you're doing everything within a public cloud environment, it's kind of all taken care of for you, right? You don't have to worry too much about I mean, you have some concern about availability zones and, and where things are and whatnot and how you get access to services, whether things are properly load balanced, but you're sort of in a walled garden where everything takes care of itself. I, I think the abstraction of the concept is extremely useful for the, from those people. So maybe the specifics of configuring a, a leaf and spine network is not necessarily useful when you're designing the cloud. But the abstraction of that concept saying the way that I'm only three hops away from any other node because of the way I've designed this, that translates well to when you're designing out your networking or you're trying to do a multi-cloud kind of situation where you need to understand the number of hops between things and latency and bandwidth. So I think if they're willing to take the abstract concepts and apply those, then it doesn't the, the skills do transfer to a certain degree. Like I have all this arcana about winds apparently that I didn't even know I had. Uh, that's not useful, but understanding the idea of a push pull replication, that, that's still useful and relevant for other things that use that same replication model. Yeah, yeah that's, I think uh, it goes, that's a good point. Yeah, I think it goes back to, you know, who, who said it earlier, right? The, 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 the people in those roles, they have to be flexible and willing to adapt with the change, right? I mean, it, that's the only constant we have in this industry is change. And so again, if they're not, if they're not flexible and adaptable to that, they're, they're just not going to succeed. And, you know, I can remember, you know, years and years ago when I got into some, some heavy kind of the, the new world of automation, right. And this goes back to um, home appraisers, right. I was working for a, uh, for a, for a bank who was, who was doing obviously a lot of, of you know, home appraisal type work and the way they were doing it at the time, this was back in, in the kind of early two thousands. 
it was, it was a very manual process, right? They would go out there and they would take, you know, pictures on a camera and go get those pictures developed. And this was before digital cameras. They would get, you know, faxes of the work orders. They would put all this stuff together. They would literally buy atlases and then tear out the pages for the maps and then, you know, reuse whatever they could until their atlas was completely worthless and buy a new one. And, you know, the, the team I was working with and, and who I was supporting, you know, from the IT side, they were, they were working on this whole new way to do appraisals. And it's what we're all familiar with now. You know, the work orders go out via email. They go out with digital cameras or just use Zillow or, or Google images to get all these pictures of the neighborhood. They use whatever, you know, street tool that they want to use to download all the maps and, and get all the comps and do all this stuff. So, it, you know, the, 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 the long story short is they went from like a 30 day process. If you ever bought or sold a house back in the early 2000s, it was like a 30 day process just to get your appraisal. Whereas, you know, we turned it into like a 24 hour turnaround to just be able to quickly, you know, the appraiser comes out and, and, and knocks it out in, in less than a day. But the people at this bank that were, you know, doing it the, the previous way and, you know, there was people just printing these reports and sending them out, you know, this was like a full time job for a lot of people and they were really worried about automation and what it was going to do to their job and, you know, we're all going to lose our job, we're not going to have work here before too long. So we were getting a lot of pushback, you know, from those teams. And again, on a daily basis, it was almost, you know, it was almost like, you know, the, the scabs, you know, crossing the picket line as we'd go into work, these people would be very angry at us. And you would just have to sit down with them and explain like, look, there's, there's so many new opportunities here. Yes, that door is closing, but look at all the doors we're opening up now, right? You can become any one of these new support teams handling all this stuff, right? Email is going to be big. You're going to have to start doing this stuff. Look at that aspect of it. All the digital camera stuff. Maybe you can get into that world or maybe you can get into the, the, the I can't remember what tool we were using at the time, but it was some street tool, you know, for, for, for pulling up the maps that we were OEM and stuff. But again, I was like, there's all these different avenues that you could go down and, and take your, you know, take your career versus being the person that was, you know, sorting printout jobs or something. So it was just, again, you got to be flexible and, and willing to adapt with the change. So this is what cares a little bit. Um, in, in my experience, you know, we have worked with, uh, worked with a lot of different teams or different companies. Um, but fundamentally, the people that we've talked to, uh, regardless of who, which industry, which sector somebody, some some customer or some partner is from, it doesn't change who we're talking to. It's always has been the networking teams, the automation teams, and that's the extent of teams that we have talked to um, from a support team perspective. I have never seen, or I've never seen issues being raised from somebody like storage background or a cloud background um, coming directly into DNS. I want to know why that is the case. Maybe something Jan can help me understand a little bit. I think um, the storage folks have usually uh, usually um, kept to themselves. Maybe uh, maybe that's the stigma. I think because um, they they had their own networks, they had the fiber channel networks, they had their own arrays that nobody understood because they had to calculate IOPS and stuff. Um, and terabytes and play with that. Um, and that's now integrating a lot with the networking, uh, with the, with the shared networks. Um, so I think the, there's a big mentality change, uh, in that area. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, but if you look at the, at the traditional on-prem storage systems, they are mostly static. Um, so like I said in the previous, uh, briefing, um, we get a couple of management IP addresses mm -hmm. and that's it. Uh, and those are static for five years, and then we replace the box. We get a couple of new IP addresses, a couple of new management addresses uh, and names, and that's it. Yeah. Uh, and that is definitely changing now as well uh, with all the scale-out systems and and with all the containers, which which um, uh, reference the storage in a different way. So um, yeah, uh, lots of changes. But I think uh, going back to to um, uh, Noel's uh, comment. I think it would be good if other teams had a, a small uh, basic introduction to storage as well. Because uh, if we if we talk with application owners or, or SQL database owners, um, they have no idea what has changed over the years with storage. Um, uh, resulting in strange requests that are still dated uh, in, the, in the early 2000s. Hey, give me a rate 10 uh, volume. Uh, oh wait, that's old school. <laughs> so, yeah. I would recommend uh, that people start with to learn about storage. This is actually a good conversation to have is 
what should those common languages be and what should everyone know about what you do and vice versa? Um, I don't have a, a specific course in mind. Um, uh, different vendors have different introduction uh, associate courses um, mm -hmm. talking about the different types of storage and how to what, what the advantages and the dis disadvantages are. So that would be probably be a good thing. Um, read a lot of blog posts as well, maybe. <laughs> I was just going to say, you know, I mean, one of the things we see quite often and, and one of the things that we actually kind of tout as, as a feature when we're dealing with APIs and specifically automation and, and more specifically self-service is, is kind of the, the argument against these guys needing to understand these guys, meaning the customers needing to understand what's changed in storage or what's, you know, DNS or how to administer DNS or what's an A record versus a C name mm -hmm. or any of that stuff. We're trying to, to tear down those walls and say, hey, via the use of a self-service portal, for example, let's, you know, let's simplify this down, I'm trying to choose my words rightly, you know, correctly, but you know, let's, let's, let's make this so simple that, you know, somebody that doesn't understand what storage is, or, you know, they're still stuck in the, the raid 10 days, right? Give them the ability to answer a simple questionnaire about, here's what you need, you know, ask, ask those three to five questions, or maybe it's 10 or 20. I, you know, I'm not a storage guy either, right? So how, how much <laughs> stuff is, you know, how much information do you need? But again, fill out this, this simple form with basic questions that they would understand that relate to their job and why they're requesting, you know, quote unquote storage. And then based on the automation and the APIs, let that automatically do that. So again, we don't need to train the masses on these things and, and let the, you know, the technology do the, do the heavy lifting for us. And, and I think that's one of the things, you know, at least from a DNS perspective, we try to focus on. Um, and again, DevOps and, and, and the teams out there that are trying to leverage the tools that we all bring to the table, it's, it's, we, we can't train these guys. I mean, look at all of us, it's, you know, collectively there's hundreds of years of experience here. So to, to train these individuals, you know, for example, in marketing, everything there is to know about DNS and all the different record types that they need to launch off a campaign, it's just never going to happen. Right. So to get out of the way we used to do things historically that used to take days or weeks or months to, to, to get through change management, let's just give them a self-service portal where they can go out there and type in a few, a, a few simple answers to some basic questions and, and, and spin everything up the way they need it. So then yeah. following the marketing example, the network team at some point then would have to learn a little bit more about what marketing's trying to do to be able to build out that self-service portal in a way that logically fits what well, I marketer, for example, I mean, would be looking yes, for. yes. But I mean, the, so, so, I think there's two things, right? There's, there's the, um, and, and on your list, it's, uh, you know, silos and collaboration. And, and I, I think that means uh, within the different IT teams, but if we, but if we do look at the marketing team for just a second, you know, if you've got a marketing team or a sales team or whatever, the IT team necessarily supports the business and whatever the business objectives are, right? And having them understand what the marketing message is that the business is trying to deliver will help them better understand the overall goals of the organization so that they can be more strategic in what they do from an IT perspective. So there's no question that that's important. But I think specifically on the on the context of, you know, you've got a, a, a large organization, you've got an automation team, a virtualization team, security, et cetera, right? They do all need to work together to make sure. So I think a couple of things. One, it has to be a top-down approach. Uh, so that from the top, culturally, you have to push those teams to collaborate and cooperate with each other. And I think that you can do that a variety of ways. You know, if, if um, someone from another group within IT is willing to do a lunch and learn where they go through the basics of the storage system that we're using. Because I'll tell you, um, one of my challenges from a, just storage specifically has always been, um, you know, from a networking perspective, I think you can learn basic networking and, and bounce around to a bunch of different vendors and everything's relatively fine. Storage feels like it, it, you know, from the, from the little I've delved into it, it feel every time I have, it feels like it's like, oh, this is really NetAppy or this is really Convolt or, you know, or this is very, you know, semantic. Um, and, and it's always kind of felt uh, sort of one off -y after you get off of the wire. Um, and, and so it's, it, it's, it gets confusing. I mean, there are some general concepts that are definitely, uh, you know, across the vendors, but I think that you, you, you have to be sort of be committed to that. And, and I think, Again, it's one of those places where the collaboration between the different teams, knowing what capability the storage team has they, that they can deliver to you that you might not have even known about helps you solve problems, right? 
And um, if you if you as an organization are committed to that and you work toward it and you and you try to create that kind of culture of sharing, it can only help. Um, and you know we see organizations we work with that um, want to do everything via API. Uh, to you know to Kevin's point, it has to be really simple and it's supposed to break down. Um, and they're, they're sort of a double-edged sword because you know if if uh, once you give someone uh, API access to something, you know they're going to use it, and uh, so you, there has to be some constraints. Um, but at the same time, I mean, that's what's going to tie it all together and make you be able to deliver things at the speed of business is the API for all these systems. And necessarily, you have to understand what the capabilities are so you can tie it all together in a way that's meaningful. Well, and that's, and that's the hard, you know, the hard part is making sure that every, everybody understands each other. But to your point, um, you know, do a lunch and learn, make sure that teams understand each other that they are familiar with, with the work uh, other teams do. Mm-hmm. Um, so at my, at my last job, I actually spent a significant amount of time in, in redesigning how the organization was structured. So instead of having isolated you know, virtualization teams or networking teams or uh, whatever teams, we, um, we basically turned that whole model upside down and, and said, okay, this is the team that's responsible for you know, this little part in the customer journey. So be it checkout or be it promotions or, you know, there were hundreds of teams. Uh, And for a lot of those teams, we actually made a decision to include a storage engineer, a networking engineer, a cloud engineer, uh, without them actually having to, um, to take responsibility for a networking system or a storage system but they were the ones that helped these teams to consume those resources, right? So one of the things um, I realized in the last year or two is that in order to be successful with, you know, transitions like this towards DevOps, towards clouds, microservices, containers, all these, th- all these things, you need to step away from actually doing the thing yourself. So don't do networking yourself anymore. Don't do storage, don't do virtualization, don't do Kubernetes platforms but instead be the consumer of those services. And then there can still be a very detailed, very specific teams that actually manage the network on, uh, underneath, as long as they're able to surface it as a surface to other teams. So the interface between teams has to become so clear that there is no longer a real need to do that lunch and learn, to, um, to help other teams understand your thing because you've abstracted it in such a way that that's no longer needed, right? Just as cloud abstracts it in a way that's so, so that it's easy to consume. Um, you know, similarly within enterprises, I see a movement more and more that, that, you know, networking, storage, virtualization, you name it, is being abstracted away to a point where people don't care anymore if it's in-house or cloud or uh, 10 years old or five years old or brand spanking new, it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, I, I agree with the idea of um, consuming and getting that perspective, stepping away from being like neck, neck deep in the technology. Yeah, getting um, away from the nitty gritty. I, it does help to give you some perspective in the same way that like when software development teams are working on a new product and user feedback is super useful because uh, you might assume a whole bunch of things about the steps that a user might take or how they're going to interact with it. But once you actually put that software or that interface in front of a user, you suddenly realize all the assumptions that you made about that technology, that that user is coming with a totally different set of assumptions. Uh, It's sort of like the first time I ever put together a, a like lunch and learn that was lab oriented and had people try to follow along a lab. It was a disaster. And it was not because the lab was bad or not because I was bad at presenting. I mean, I wasn't the greatest presenter in the world, but like the main problem was I had made assumptions about how people were going to interact with the lab, that they were going to, you know, read the steps. (laughs) They were going (laughs) to follow the directions that I was being clear about how I was explaining things. And after sitting down with like four or five people in a row who misunderstood different portions of the lab and how to do it, I was like, oh, I really need to user test this kind of thing before I uh, assume that a class of 20 is just going to look at my lab guy and be like, this is perfect. I have no problems. Um, And I think when it comes to these advanced technologies and breaking down silos, it's sort of 
have the storage team talk to the networking team and understand how the networking team sees what the storage team does and how you know the two are interfacing with each other and it doesn't have to necessarily be super formal like just having two network guys and two storage guys or gals going out to lunch and and you know shooting the breeze they're going to learn a lot even if it's not highly structured um, maybe even more if it's not highly structured and they don't feel like it's an assignment that they have to do you know it's just <laughs> let, let's be somewhat social um, but you do get back to the problem that a lot of people in technology uh, ourselves excluded because we're all in this but a lot of people are very introverted and don't like to have conversations with people they don't know so uh, you do have that kind of working against you if you do go talk to that storage person and be like hey let's go grab lunch and they're like no i sit at my desk and i eat cup of noodle and don't talk That's to right. me That's right. okay you're only going to get so far right but uh <laughs> Hopefully there's some synergy across the different uh, silos. If, if you do reach out, that they'll, they'll reciprocate. Yeah, you reminded me of two things that Kevin and I have joked. Uh, Kevin and I have joked for, for quite a while. So one, we joked that we can't wait to work for a vendor. Because, or sorry, to, we can't wait to not work for a vendor and to work for, for a customer again because we're going to make the vendor's lives hell. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that, that occurred to me is if you do have a vendor for you know, virtualization or storage or whatever, you, know, you can leverage that vendor to come in so that you don't have to do it and have them do a basics presentation to your customers. Vendors will do a lot more, I think, in some cases than, than we realize. Uh, and, and you have a lot of leverage, especially if there is a, uh, a sale coming up, uh, you, you have a lot of leverage to get vendors to do more for you and for your team. So, so we also joke, you know, as necessarily like we work in sales, right? And so we're, we work in sales for a vendor we have for a long time and we have to be professionally extroverted, right? Like personally, he and I are the same way. We, we try, you know, we'd rather just hang out and not necessarily eat the cup of noodles, but, you know, sit at our desk or whatever and, and read. <laughs> Uh, but but you you sort of have to push yourself to be out there, and I actually think it's a it's a career skill for anyone in our field, right? Like the communication part of it is a big part of what we do, and you can't it's not good enough for you to just sit at your desk and eat a cup of noodles. You should be pushing yourself, even if it's uncomfortable, to go out there and talk to other people. And I, I think that that's you know yeah there there's going to be people um, you know who it's just really difficult for them and they're not able to do it, but but your career will be better off if you can represent your ideas up to, you know, up the chain of command to, you know, your leadership uh, and even to, you know, your subordinates or to people at your level. I mean, the more that you're able to communicate and share, the, the better off you're going to be. And I think your life just in general might be a little bit better. <laughs> like, yeah. like when you need to go ask for something, having that pre-existing relationship with, you know, the networking team means it's going to be that much easier to get the thing you need done. Um, you know, next time you need to get garner support from a bunch of teams to get a project off the ground or you know you want to prove your innocence people are a little more likely to believe you if they know who you are versus you're some stranger who like sits at their desk never talks to anyone is kind of squirrely they're like oh, i don't trust that guy it's probably something he did <laughs> um yeah it just I agree with the fact that like a lot of the times I would rather just sit in my basement while well, I am sitting in my basement, but I'd rather just sit in my basement and, and write posts or code or anything else, but interact with another human being, especially after like a week of a conference or something. Uh, but I acknowledge the fact that if I don't get out, if I don't talk to people, uh, it stagnates my learning and makes my life slightly more difficult. So I guess suck it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And people aren't that scary. They're really not. Mostly no, nice. Not. <laughs> Most of them. Most, Most yeah. of them. <laughs> That's the other thing I always say. I'm like, it, this is only work, guys. I mean, you know, luckily, most of us, I'm assuming, don't work in a life or death kind of situation on a daily basis. And I always just have to tell myself, you know, I, I get stressed out or I get overwhelmed. I'm like, man, this is just work, right? What? It's not the end of the world if this doesn't get done or if this happens or that happens. It's it's just work now. And granted, See, take, that with, the, Kevin, take that with a grain of salt, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, you're working in customer support, maybe a little bit different story, right? But, yes, but again, maybe, maybe, Mar, maybe it's just a, a matter of reminding your customers that, hey, buddy, this is just work, right? I mean, it's, it's <laughs> those things like, good, good luck yeah. yeah, exactly. If I could, if I could say that to our healthcare customers, you know, I, I think they would shoot us back. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Obviously, there's, there's different situations and scenarios, but, you know, by and far, for the most part, you know, what we're doing here is, is, is extremely important in a lot of cases, but, you know, the, the, the level of stress and the, the, 
the animosity we get in these silos and the, you know, the walls that we build and the conflicts that are created, it's, it's almost comical when we take a step back and look at it. Well, and also if people's lives really are on the line for this kind of work and this kind of collaboration, then definitely get up and go talk to somebody. Yeah. Even more the reason, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. So I think we covered that, um, that middle bullet pretty well. Like if there's no more tips or anything, any pieces of advice that we can give around that, uh, talked about automation and DevOps, but I'm wondering you, you know, Ned, is there anything else on that side that we want to cover or are we good? Well, I think we're good. Um, I, in our in the lead up to this, the preparation, uh, I did start picking Noel's brain a little bit about the world of DNS sec. So uh, I don't know if we want to get into that a little bit, but kind of what's going on with DNS sec? What's going on with DOH and DOT? What's the intersection there? Um, I'm I'm just curious about other people's reactions and opinions because um, I don't think I have enough information to to make an informed opinion about any of those things. Sure. So why don't we uh, why don't we tackle Doe and Dot first? Um, and again, I'm, I'm going to stay reasonably high level. Um, but um, and you know, I, you can go online and find a video of me saying that I think Doe and Dot or, or Doe specifically is a bad idea. Doe Doe seems like it might win the war between Doe and Dot in terms of what's going. So Doe is DNS over HTTPS. Uh, Dot is DNS over TLS. Um, they work differently, uh, but they do something similar, which is they encrypt the DNS queries and query responses uh, from endpoints to DNS servers. Uh, DNSSEC uh, is a little bit different in that DNSSEC is a protocol that allows you, it's an extension to a DNS server that allows you to establish a chain of trust so that the endpoint, when it makes a DNS query, can ensure that the response that it's given uh, is, and, and it does it, uh, you know, a DNS, um, a, a, a fully, quiet, fully qualified domain name is, is made up of, you know, if, if we look at uh, www.techfieldday.com, the .com is the top level domain, and then you have the Tech Field Day, which is the domain, and then www is either normally an alias or it could be a host name, but it's a, it's a kind of a, a chain of, of, of uh, records there. And so if you are working in an environment where uh, you don't have that record cached somewhere, you have to go through the chain. You have to go through the root server, which is the invisible dot at the very end of that, and ask him, hey, you know, where do I go to find the .com server? And then you have to find the .com server. And DNSSEC allows you to trust that at every point along the way, the server that is responding to you and giving you an answer back uh, is a trusted server and is authoritative for those records and is the real server for those records and not someone who's a man in the middle who's pretending to be there. So the two technologies are a little bit different. Um, and DNSSEC is one that's been around for, um, you know, uh, 25 years, I want to say, something like that. Um, and uh, it, it is, uh, if you were to go and, and, and grab DNS and bind and crack it open and figure out how to, co how to configure DNSSEC, uh, I think it's, it can be very complicated. Uh, and it seems complicated uh, depending on which server platform you're using, what vendor you might be using to do DNS. Uh, and, you know, I, I had that experience, right, where I actually went to configure it by, by scratch for, from scratch. And it was really, really difficult. And I think that that's put a lot of people off from, from using it um, for the most part. I think, um, if I, could interrupt, of, I, think, I think with DNSSEC and, you know, configuration wise and what all you need, I think people find it often complicated um, because they have to manage DNSSEC data. But hmm. if you are one of those um, DNS service providers, that don't host any of data yourself and the sole function of your servers is to go and fetch it from somewhere else. The configuration wise, you strip down 99% of what's needed from that bind book to turn on DNSSEC. And it will do the same thing that Noel just talked about. That you start from the dot, go to the com, go to tech field day, and it keeps on validating all the way down um, and until you find the response and sends it back. But like Noel said, the, one, the thing that puts people off is hosting DNSSEC signed data uh, on the external server side, which is often um, complicated. Yeah. Um, and then there's a lot of vendors in space in the space that can simplify things for you. But even after that, you have to then own the yearly, the monthly rotations of keys and uh, things of that sort, which is still a manual work um, that's required by the system. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, I would say nomenclature and components, right? When you, and I'm not going to explain what all these are, but when you start, you know, KSK, RRC, you know, D, signed zones, like signed records, you know, what happens when you add a new record to a zone, you know, and, and all that stuff is taken care of. But it's, I, I honestly, if you go watch a video on YouTube, it seems significantly more complicated than it has to be from a configuration perspective. <laughs> That, it was that just built into the spec that way, or is that the sort of thing that it could have been made easier and more simple uh, and still just as secure and it just never re reached the adoption point where it would become simple? I think adoption wise, um, at some point, the US government mandated that everything, every agency that falls into the US government umbrella has to have their external DNS data um, signed by DNSSEC. There's no other way. But DNSSEC, um, if you go and read history on it, it's it's primarily made um, to solve two use cases. One, which is the bigger one, is that it needs to be backward compatible. And hence why there's a lot of stuff that they have to do around DNS to make it not break DNS, because a lot of the legacy systems don't understand DNSSEC today. And so when you introduce DNSSEC, it adds additional headers, it, do, it adds additional records, and we try to make it simple for the systems but we made it complicated for sysadmins. Um, and I think at that time, it, when DSA came out, it, the intention was never to encrypt the traffic between the servers and the clients. It was more so that you can validate the data itself. I don't think cybersecurity was, it, was at its prime when this came out, so it was never a thought, I would say, that, uh, that data encryption is a thing that needs to be done on DNS as well. Yeah. That that seems to have plagued many an internet thing in its time is it was never designed with security in mind back in the day. And that all had to kind of be bolted on later. Yeah. Um, is there anything different about, and I don't know if anybody knows this, but I know when they were designing IPv6, that was much more, okay, security was in mind because it's a little more modern. And, and so there's some security mechanisms just built into IPv6 that IPv4 never had. Uh, is there anything similar with IPv6 for DNSSEC or is DNSSEC just doesn't care about which of the two is, is being used? Uh, so uh, DNSSEC generally doesn't care, but and what DNSSEC does is it will sign the like type records with one hashing algorithm of signature that all your A records, all your quality records will use this key. So DNS works above the IP stack, so it doesn't care if it's IPv4 initiated or IPv6 initiated. Um, um, it does. It does work the same on IPv4 as IPv6. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I guess that that probably answers most of my questions about DNSSEC, which means I, I probably won't have to learn a whole lot more about it, unless yeah. for some reason it, it gains mass adoption out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, and, and I would say, you know, one one other thing about DNSSEC, and Amar spoke to kind of the backward compatibility aspect of it. You're unlikely to have a problem with it. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's unlikely to cause you a problem. I think the biggest problem is when you want to do what's called DNSSEC validation. You want to make sure that DNSSEC is happening to a record that you're querying, and it's not. That's where you can, if you're a user of DNS, that's where you can have a problem. If you're an administrator of DNS, it's a different story. Then you have to do some troubleshooting and figure out where the trust chain is broken or something like that. But mm -hmm. um, it, that's the other kind of reason why DNSSEC is not maybe is thought about because you don't really necessarily have to worry about it unless you really care that you're validating those records. Right. Um, that kind of reminded me of something else that I think happened this, maybe this year or last year. Uh, I remember just reading a blurb about a DNS day where the, the day when DNS might break or something. DNS oh, flag day. Flag day. That's what it was. What was that all about? Because you, you mentioned backwards compatibility, and I feel like that had something to do with like forcing everybody to a newer or slightly newer standard of DNS. So, the, so they covered that really well uh, on uh, one of the packet pushers episodes, and I, I would have to find it for you. But mm -hmm. DNS flag day. Um, so DNS is a 35 year old protocol. Uh, I think it was, I think it's, I think it's 35. I'd have to, I'd have to go wow. look, but I think it was 1984, 1985 uh, was when DNS was, was first kind of uh, put into play uh, and, and different models of DNS had existed before that as well. Um, primarily host files or distributed host files, things like that. Um, but because of the age of the protocol, 
uh, it necessarily has had layers and layers and layers of additional things put on it, including something called extensions to DNS or eDNS zero. Uh, and there are many, many servers out on, on the internet that don't support all of the latest functionality from a DNS perspective. Uh, and so what DNS flag day was, was a day to, um, to say, I can't remember if it was to specifically uh, test or to, or to test and say that, you know, yes, your DNS servers support all of the latest extensions and can respond to queries in the appropriate way for a modern client. And I think Amar is like dying to speak. So I'm going to shut up for a second. <laughs> oh, so, so I think this, this ties back to a DNSSEC a little bit that, you know, since DNSSEC was introduced into DNS, we, I think we spoke at the last, um, the briefing that it, it causes more stress on the network that now your network devices that know that DNS is 512 bytes, DNS is not 512 bytes anymore. It's much bigger than that. And one of the reasons uh, why this is uh, this was important is that with introduction of DNSSEC, ADNS, which is extensions to you know, DNS mechanism, allowed for DNS to still operate on UDP versus TCP because that would have caused much more uh, you know, problems on not just now the networking, but also on the servers themselves that are now operating on TCP versus UDP. Um, and imagine if your DNS server is a 50,000 query per second server, now you're causing, you know, looking at trouble. So they introduced uh, eDNS to allow for DNSSEC and the flags to propagate easily. So I think the flag day was um, there to talk about the eDNS has helped us get this far but we now need to make it more stricter um, to allow for better compliance. So that's when they introduced a version for ADNS1 and most of the software providers were now releasing patches to comply with ADNS1, ADNS but it was also gonna break ADNS0, which is what's in use in legacy and current systems today. Okay, yeah, so breaking, breaking can be bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so I got to imagine like this uh, push for uh, well, DOH seems to be the thing that's going to probably win out long term. Is that that's going to force another upgrade uh, if ISPs and, and these different providers want to support that protocol? Absolutely. And that's probably sort of my biggest concern with Doe right now uh, and, and why it's. Um, you know, so Doe, and, and I'm going to call it that, but DNS over HTTPS is, um, you know, the, the idea is that your DNS queries will now be encrypted like all the other traffic that you have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you've ever been in a coffee shop or something like that, I think we're all aware that, you know, when I'm going to my bank's website, I'm using HTTPS, so it's encrypted. So it's not that big of a deal if I'm not using a VPN or something like that, which encrypts sort of all my traffic off of my endpoint. Um, but the DNS queries are in clear text. And if you, if, if you were to look at any person's DNS queries over the course of, uh, of a full day, let's say for all their devices, um, you could learn a lot about that individual, right? Um, and when you start to, if you're an ISP or you're someone who's hosting DNS servers on the internet and you're looking at an individual's queries in aggregate, you're seeing a whole bunch of data that can be useful to advertisers. It can be useful to, to lots and lots of people. It, it could be useful to, you know, some kind of a foreign actor who's trying to do some kind of espionage. Right? I mean, there's, there's, there's just lots of uses for it. Mm -hmm. and, and the challenge is, is that, you know, DNS has always been kind of plain text and an individual DNS query you probably don't care about. It's not a big deal, but again, in aggregate, it's a challenge. And so the idea is, hey, let's encrypt this traffic. Everything else is encrypted now. Um, uh, you know, again, and, I, and that's a good idea. I like that idea. That's fine. The problem that I have is right now, the number of Doe servers that are available on the internet. So when I, when I have a, an endpoint that I, and I say, I'm going to use DNS over HTTPS on this endpoint, first of all, almost definitely none of my internal servers are going to be Doe enabled. So there's going to have to be some configuration done there. Um, and, you know, Microsoft just recently announced that they're going to um, make all of their endpoints use DNS over HTTPS in the future. And yet their DNS server doesn't support Doe and, bind, and ISC's bind does not support Doe right now. Um, and so as a consumer, as, a, as an end user, right, because again, it's not going to work in an internal corporate environment today or in the next five years based on the way that, you know, some organizations upgrade. Mm -hmm. um, so. I only have a handful of choices about who I want to point DNS to. 
uh, in addition to that, uh, and specifically DNS over HTTPS. I only have a handful of choices. I can use Cloudflare, I can use Google, uh, you know, whatever. And so if the advertisement to me as a consumer is, hey, this is gonna help your privacy. Yeah, I'm not gonna point to my ISP who maybe I trust, maybe I don't, whatever, but I'm gonna point to Google or I'm gonna point to Cloudflare <laughs> or I'm gonna point to some other organization. And so the, the, the problem that I have with it is I do think this is what's going to happen. It's, it's for sure, DNS is gonna be encrypted like every other protocol, there's no question. But what's frustrating for me right now is they're selling it as a privacy solution and yet there just aren't enough choices for me to feel like I really have privacy. I would almost rather, and actually I would rather, just get a VPN client, encrypt mm -hmm. all of my traffic, and point to, you know, again, so I wanna do something, I'm gonna, I'm gonna point to one of my VPN points of presence, and then I'm gonna disconnect, point to a different one, and do something different. I mean, if I'm really concerned about my privacy, I'm gonna do something like that rather than, you know, uh, continue. And again, that's only assuming that I've, I've done some research and trust my VPN provider, right? Because that's a whole nother discussion. But that's my frustration right now is I just feel like it's sold as privacy and yet you have a very, very limited choice. And it's not like you can host your own DNS over HTTPS server at your house today. See, to me, I take it, you know, on that same kind of thought process, but I take it a little bit even higher than that, right? So again, Noel, going back to your point about what you can see and in, in what information over the course of a day, your DNS records can, can divulge, right? The way this is being introduced is, is a, is a user-based privacy thing, right? It's, it's based off of our browser, right? What about the, the, the 70 other applications running on my device that are all making DNS queries that now are not encrypted, right? So I'm all for encrypting the traffic. To your point, VPN, let's go, right? It's, that's the way to, to, to kind of look at this because now I'm getting whole box type encryption for, for lack of a better term, right? All the applications, everything running on my device is, is now under the same level of protection versus just, just my browser. And that, that browser, I bet if you go back and look at my DNS queries throughout the day, very few of them, I would say, you know, a, a very small percentage of them are actually coming from my browser. I'm not making a ton of DNS, um, you know, requests, mm -hmm. um, you know, through a browser only. If you look at, you know, say that the thousand that come through in an hour from my one MacBook, a fraction of them are from my browser. The rest of them are from all the other applications and, and system things that are making DNS calls. So, so that's where I kind of look at it like, I, I'm, I'm good with the idea, like you said, of encrypting everything, right? Everything else is already encrypted. Why, why not? But it's just the approach seems to be very consumer centric right now based on, on, on user browser type usage versus, well, versus the true security aspect of it. And, and the other way where it's consumer centric and maybe a little bit concerning for enterprises is the idea. And, and again, I, I, this is one of those things that's going to get, get worked out in the details. So, uh, but, but for right now, and Ned, I was listening to, I forget which one of your podcasts, but you had a gentleman on who was talking about using DNS in the cloud environment at, uh, to get actual data on what the endpoints are doing because everything else was encrypted, but DNS was something that they could see so they could track what was going on. Mm -hmm. And we see, we see corporate organizations mining DNS data because it's in plain text. I mean, they're going to have some need to have necessarily some other view into the DNS data because um, they're using that DNS data to, to, to understand what the endpoints are doing, to understand whether there's a potential security issue, to understand, I mean, you know, Cisco's, um, you know, purchased open DNS based on the fact that they could use the DNS intelligence to block malware and block threats and things like that. And so you, you, the, the concern that I have is if everything is in HTTPS, if you're looking at an endpoint and you have no way to decrypt it or to know which HTTPS traffic is browser-based to a website versus DNS-based to a DNS server, I mean, you know, I think as employees, sometimes you hear concern about the fact that the organization has put a proxy server in place that does a man in the middle before data is going out to the internet because now you don't have any privacy. Um, in your in your corporate environment and look in a lot of environments that makes a lot of sense but now you're gonna have to have bigger proxy servers or bigger devices that can decrypt re-encrypt right which is going to add latency to what you're doing just so that you can look at that traffic so I think that there are some challenges mm. that we need to solve and 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 maybe you know again I can think of a lot of ways we could solve those problems maybe internally it's plain text DNS until you get to your internal Doe server that then does Doe resolution out to the internet or something like that so that you can, you can, so you're, you're encrypting only one time and it, it's, it's a little bit safer. I mean, again, 
that's to be determined, right? And and there we're you know there are different organizations that are working to push these standards forward. But I just think right now there's this massive push for privacy. By the way, from a bunch of people who are still using Instagram and face you know Facebook and Twitter and and whatever. But there's this massive push for privacy. But at the same time, there are implications to doing this that have not, I don't think have been completely resolved. So it reminds me a lot of what happened when iPhones started moving from the personal into the, the corporate, right? Uh, the corporate world was not ready to deal with iPhones and mobile devices and being able to properly administrate them, lock them down, and a whole bunch of solutions came out to handle mobile device management and mobile application management because there was nothing in place and it kind of just took people unawares. But when your CEO walked in with his brand new iPhone and iPad and was like, these need to work on the corporate network, you're like, okay, I guess that's what I'm doing. Uh, so this is kind of a similar thing and it's being pushed by, by Google by adding that in Chrome by default. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's enabled by default, but it's definitely there by default. And then uh, Firefox has it there and enabled by default, I think, with the yep. latest version. So uh, it's definitely being pushed from the consumer space into the corporate space. And now, once again, somebody's going to have to figure out how to deal with that. And it's it's going to be a company that's somewhat nimble or maybe a brand new company that sees a, an opportunity and a gap there. So uh, startup idea, anybody? Anybody yeah. want to start? Yeah. <laughs> so, something that you reminded me, Nat, about the iPhones, um, um, working in the DNS space quickly, um, I know how many sysadmins that manage DNS hate the iPhones because every <laughs> single one of them, they come with the same name, iPhone.org. And you end up with the iPhone record that links to now 60 IPs and you cannot tell who which is who, who's who. <laughs> yeah, uh, I said that, that, that is something up to the, if you have at least have it under MDM, you can like force a rename of right. the phone, I think. <laughs> yeah. I, I was just going to say that that's that NAC dream that, that uh, has never been realized, I think. Right. Cause that would, that would solve that problem. But uh, it, it, I've seen like one organization actually successfully get NAC set up and working, but mm -hmm. it was very fragile. Like don't sneeze at it. Cause yeah. it's, right. it's <laughs> very much like DLP, very, very much like DLP. Right. Once, once, you know, once you get it set up and the company can't culture, the stomach's just not there for it. So it quickly gets, uh, it's the kibosh. Yeah. Well, yeah. People just find ways around it. That's, yeah. If you make any security control too onerous, people will be like, oh, well, I can just go around this way. Yeah. Uh, what can you do? Well, one of the things I think, I think you all touched on the DOS and the different implications of you know, putting it out now and you know, we're not ready for it. Uh, the other one that I uh, was reading up on just a couple of days ago is a lot of the malware detection today um, and the cybersecurity teams that are you know, inside a corporate network, they do a lot of their work through DNS. And the moment you turn encryption on a DNS, you can say bye bye to finding out who which machine is running which malware because everything is unencrypted. It's hard to decode it and put it back. Now where you need to respond within minutes and some have SLAs that are way much stricter than the others. Now you're avoiding all those SLAs because you need to your system is slowing you down now versus making you faster. I think there's this other additional point of like centralization of the internet if only certain actors are able to encrypt those queries and being a point of failure if one of them goes down. Right, right, right. And and that's where, you know, it's it's kind of funny. Like Cloudflare is is known as a an organization that values privacy, that deletes records, that doesn't keep records, things like that. And you know, it reminds me of a conversation I was having with my, one of my good friends uh, about my iOS device, right? I love my iPhone, you know, take it from my cold dead hands, but you know, I trust Apple necessarily, right? Like everything that I have is in iCloud from a, you know, like all my email, et cetera, et cetera. And right now, uh, Apple, you know, when, when they have like a security blip where they're recording conversations or whatever, I don't worry so much because I don't think that they care. Uh, and, I, and I actually had conversations with folks at Apple and I know they don't care about my personal data or about selling my data or whatever. And that's fine right now. But what happens when Tim Cook is no longer the CEO and, the, and, and they get a different board and the board wants to do more, you know, mining of customer data or something like that. So it's like all of these organizations that we're dealing with are publicly traded for-profit companies. And at some point in time, if Cloudflare, and again, I, I'm not saying anything bad about Cloudflare, I, I like what they do, but maybe they change in the future. And as a consumer where if all my, you know, all my data of some kind is going toward one organization, what's the impact of that on me if, they, if their kind of ethics change? That's true. I mean, I guess 
<laughs> to a certain point, a lot of us are just kind of married to the device we have. <laughs> it's it's yeah. hard to get yeah. away from it, uh, unfortunately, uh, for, for better or for worse. Um, but yeah, I guess the, the, the solution is if the stance of Apple changes and you're an Apple consumer, you could go somewhere else. But do you necessarily trust Android anymore or, uh, well, or Android or, uh, wait, it's just the two of them. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and then the other thing too is what's the, I mean, for you and I, that's not, that's not hard, right? Like for you and I, that would be easy. I, I mean, I, and, and when I say easy, relatively easy, I wouldn't want to move all of my, all of my uh, digital life out of, you know, the services that I get from Apple, right? And like, you know, I got photos there and whatever, but for my mom or for your mom or for, you know, grandma or, you know, uh, you know your friend who doesn't, who, who, who works in marketing, right? Hi, Dana. Um, you know, it, it might be a lot more difficult because, because, you know, they don't have that kind of technical knowledge, that technical background. And so, you know, our digital privacy is something that really concerns me. Um, you know, our kids are growing up in an environment where their photos and images have been shared since day one. Uh, and I know that a lot of the, I'm not, I'm not going to use names, but I know that social media companies, regardless of whether you have an account or whether you don't or whatever, they are tracking you as an individual with a serial number the first time that your photo appears on one of their services. And they do that so that when you, when you finally register an account, because you get to a certain age, you immediately have all your friends, you know, they're, they're there and you, and you can be friends with them. And so it's, it is something that I get concerned about. Sorry. I know it's not like necessarily core to what we we're talking about, but it's, it's related for sure. Yeah, no, I agree. These are almost the costs that we accept as part of living life where we do and the way that we like to, and the way that the people we love do. And we kind of wait to see how it plays out. So that was really interesting. I found personally, but I'm curious in the last five minutes, um, A, is there anything that you feel like we should have brought up that we didn't bring up? Is there a question that you have that we can either answer right now or just going forward to think about for when we're talking about different people with different skill sets and different uh, ways that they see their organization's technology? Hmm. Super. I, I had a question for, you know, you seems to really like, and I'm not, I'm putting words in your mouth right now. So like, feel free to tell me I, I misheard you or whatever, but you seem to really love managed service providers well, and the, well, I, okay. I love, up? I love it as a service. Um, okay. So having clearly defined boundaries between different teams um, and instead of just doing a technology thing, thinking about how technology is consumed wherever you are. If you are at an MSP, a cloud provider, somewhere within your organization. Um, but that whole thinking around a service boundary is really interesting to me. Yeah, definitely. So you just want the IT to be consumed as a service. You don't care if it's an outside organization. Because I, I can tell you, like, the organizations that I've spoken to have had managed mm -hmm. service provider relationships in general. Mm -hmm. I, I have yet to, I mean, I would love to find one, but I have yet to find one who's real happy with the yeah. service that they're getting uh, ever. And, and I, you know, there's been a lot of different organizations that, you know, and I'm not, I'm not going to mention names, but mm -hmm. that's the thing that's surprising me. I, I agree. IT needs to be consumed and offered as a service uh, yeah. for sure. But um, it's just outside organizations tend to, it, it's like a, your neighbor watching your garden and they mm -hmm. water it, but they don't ever weed and they don't ever, you know, put any care into it. And that, that's been a challenge that I've seen with every customer that I've ever seen in that kind of a, an environment. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not, not, not necessarily talking about a managed service. I'm really talking about the service boundaries okay. of whatever you cool. do. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Because I come from an MSP background. I used to be CTO of a company like that. And yes, uh, definitely we took care of other people's lawns and they were horrible. Yeah, and and, I, and by the way, I, I have a one of my best friends uh, works at uh, Atos, and um, you know he's told me that you know, there's there's a customer side of it too, right? You try mm -hmm. to you try to hammer out the right uh, T's and C's with them to make sure, and the right SLAs to make sure that you're you're doing what needs to be done. And a lot of times, yeah. the customer either doesn't want to pay for it or doesn't want to. You know, it, 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 it can be a real challenge. Uh, and yeah. so that's, yeah. Well, and, and that's, again, why uh, standardizing that interface between whoever it is, like if it's two different companies, if it's an MSP and a client uh, or within the company, um, I mean, one thing that public cloud has given us is that very standardized way of consuming services. There's just no contract to be negotiated. And it's the, mm -hmm. the same thing 
I'm consuming whatever it is, a database, a web server, a whatever as a service. Yep. Um, yeah. And it's just the ability to, to either find someone who will manage it for you or you do it yourself. But public cloud has given us that, that very strict interface separating the mm -hmm. two. I think you can make a strong argument that public cloud has done absolutely amazing things for just the on-premises IT teams in terms of how they yes. think about and how they offer services. Yeah. Yeah. And again, that's, that's why the whole DevOps transformation for a lot of companies is so hard because it requires them to shift this thinking. This is the major bottleneck companies go up against because they have tens of, or hundreds of people that are not in this mindset, but are in a role that will change significantly, significantly because of this. Okay, if there's nothing else, then I feel like we're literally right on time. Well, that was fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah thank you guys. Yeah, yeah I appreciate it. <laughs>